books that we will have today. It is a topic that students find it hard to understand. It is hard to learn. Maybe the implications of something that is so daily, such as imaginaries, for example, politic imaginary. So, it is curious that this happens. I wanted to share with you this impression that I have regarding the difficulty that the students have when understanding imaginary. Here I have some definitions of the topic of imaginaries. There is one that I always use that was created in 2005. Harvey said something about imaginaries in territories. So he says that imaginaries can be understood as practices and processes that allow individuals to find their place in a specific territory. It is also related to biography and the relevance of situations in different contexts. It also allows to give a meaning to the space, to the territory. And also some daily terms are involved, such as memory, empathy, imagination, creativity. All of these topics we will be addressing in today's talks. I would also like to take the words of Denise Crosscroft in 2005. And he says that the imaginaries are spaces, both visuals and spiritual. And this is performed in images and metaphors, and we understand nature through this. And here we talk about the power of metaphors, the power of language, the power of representation, the comprehension and the interpretation of the territorial parts. I think that we will have the opportunity during the conversation later to talk about what it means to use this metaphors because also sometimes violence and hegemonic powers are involved in this dynamic anyway as i already i as i always say to my students i'm not fun of defining things what is this what is that i prefer to think how things operate so we will see now how Imaginary is upright who constructs them and for who are their services. How can we see them? How can we counter count these imaginaries? So having said that, we're going to begin. The first round table. So this Felipe Aracena. The floor is yours. He is here to present his talk called Geopolitics and Territorial Decolonization Between the Economic Pragmatism and Political Idealism. Felipe, you have 15 minutes to present. Mm, we will have. 15 minutes stop. So when you have two minutes left, I'm going to let you know. After all the talks, we will have a table, literally, to speak about these topics, to talk a bit more about this. So Felipe, welcome. Good morning. And please, let's begin. Thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes, everything's working well. Good morning, everyone. 
it is a pleasure to be here, even though I'm joining you online. For personal reasons, I couldn't travel. I wanted to travel to be there with you in person, but I couldn't, so I'm joining you online. I'm going to share my screen. And please tell me who can see. Can you see this? Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. So you have already mentioned the title of my talk. So I'm going to give you some details that I think are important. I come from history and from international relations. So the phenomena that I study and analyze are always from that point of view, from those disciplines. That's why this is the title of my presentation. I'm going to try to cross this and create a dialogue between geopolitics and processes of decolonization. And besides, try to dialogue between pragmatism, specifically in the economy in different countries, and it tries to um, it hits, let's say, their political idealism. So we're going to talk about this, and then very briefly, I'm going to analyze a case of San Cristóbal de las Casas in Mexico, in Chiapas, and Caracol Tic, that is an autonomous municipality from the Zapatista. So I'm going to mention all of these elements and we will see how these imaginaries are generated, where they come from. I always um, speak from, from history. I, I take some authors, Wallerstein, um, and he he doesn't go far from this uh, tradition of the capitalist world. Um, he analyzes this world system uh, beginning from the modern world, and he establishes a, a continuous line of a capitalist world. And why why do I say that? Um, because it is important to appreciate that the imaginaries, or at least um, how I see it, uh, imaginaries are, of course, uh, hegemonic, uh, beginning from the 16th century, uh, based on the state and as well based uh, on the modern state. So therefore, they extend and amplify their uh, hegemonic exception of the world. So here we have what's, what has been going on during the centuries um, when it comes to the consolidation of a capitalist uh, world system, beginning uh, on the 16th century with the colonization of America by European powers. There's also a modification of property and land use of the territory uh, by the colonies. Then we go to the 18th century with the industrialization European process that is very important to understand uh, some things such as uh, urbanization, the herb and the power that the herb and the state uh, have to generate these uh, urbanization processes uh, and this uh, industrialization process that comes along with um, Burgos um, centers and the state. Then we go to the 19th century when we have an expansion and consolidation of the capitalist and society system. We have this capitalist globalization and it's very important here to understand uh, the background of this um, capitalist world system 
and, and many other statements uh, from the um, they stated this idea of, of uh, center peripheries or um, otherwise the, the, the theory of uh, dependence because here in the 19th century we have this divergence between the north uh, global countries and the south global countries um, with the first having a, a bigger industrial and the ones that are left behind. Then we have uh, the 20th century with the uh, economical opening of the world, uh, the, the global markets, uh, Germany, um, where it begins uh, to be uh, such a monopoly. And, and this, of course, comes with this consolidation of this uh, world system. So we have four stages uh, that are key where the capitalism ignores some boundaries, searching for benefits, it um, becomes worldwide. Then after we have a development of a world system integrated under the market logic, that means that not only the boundaries are trespassed, they, they practically disappear, but um, we, we see also a generation of, of the wealth and pragmatism based on the state and that is inside a, within a whole um, market logic uh, where we see this this um, this flow of, of capital um, we have of course uh, exploitation of natural resources and a capture of, of the um, of the labor force uh, where the countries are, are being benefited uh, unequitably uh, from this uh, workforce. And so what I'm, I'm, I'm saying here is that imaginaries, these two imaginaries that I'm, I'm seeing here and that are developed in Chiapas and the, the region uh, in Mexico, uh, that is a city, uh, the a colonial city, they clash but beyond that, they are all they, they will always clash, and it's very very um, unlikely that the other imaginary, um, the different imaginary, the one that comes from the from the from the grassroots, can become a Germany because there's a pragmatism that is macro, that comes from the state from the decisions of the state uh, that create, of course, not only a geopolitical strategy and economical strategy, but they're also uh, constantly creating imaginaries that are made to legitimate processes, um, political processes, economical internal processes. And in this sense, Mexico um, cannot escape this situation, even when it's very big, it's very important. But for example, during the 80s and 90s, um, it was very important um, economically speaking, within the the world of the system, the the system, the world system. Sorry. Um, for example, Mexico decided that the entering and the entering uh, the, the, their uh, economic um, insertion, insertion um, its vision, its geopolitical uh, vision, will be in North America. So, beginning from here. Um, we can see a, a whole vision of the state that is pragmatic. It, it doesn't leave space for another imaginary, for another vision. It is, of course, top down from, from the state vision. Here we have how it is uh, articulated, how the, the state power is articulated. This is a text from 2017. Um, the formal aspects of the state, uh, the political representation going through an institutional architecture, um, as Jessup said, uh, bureaucracy, state bureaucracy, and of course the um, state intervention that is hegemonic. And we have as well um, strategic aspects of the state, that is the creation of social basis, a social basis, sorry, uh, projects that uh, are carried um, out from their from its own vision, strategically speaking, 
And we also have to understand how uh, capital, uh, global capital fluxes, uh, flows, sorry, uh, are, are posi positioned and how the states position, well, and how they position themselves within the whole system, how does uh, that intervene as well uh, on the internal vision uh, regarding the strategic uh, goals that they have towards the whole world. Here, for example, we have big flows um, from where they come and where, where they're going. Here we have a small, a small map, yes, uh, a diagram of uh, Le Monde Diplomatique, uh, where we can see the, 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 the urban centers and the periphery. We, of course, see Latin America and Africa uh, as the periphery uh, from this, this uh, capitalist world system. And of course, the centers are Europe, uh, traditional, uh, long-standing center, and North America, specifically the United States. And then we have a third center that is new. Um, uh, Latin America goes as well, and this is the Asian Pacific uh, Center. Uh, it's it's very new um, because it is mainly from the 70s that started taking form, and where we started the uh, seeing modernization in South Korea um, regarding export and how Latin America um, shapes, reshapes their their mechanisms to be played not only with Europe and North America, but as well with um, Asia Pacific. Here um, down the screen, we have the volume of uh, commodities commerce and how countries are positioned within this um, within this this um, world board let's say well this is Mexico and where where Mexico is is looking to uh, of course the United States um, at the beginning of the 20th, uh, 20th uh, century, there was a saying, so far from God and so close from the United States. Of course, uh, the United States is the center um, of the vision uh, of Mexico, but uh, Mexico is also looking uh, to Asia Pacific, Korea and China. And also, um, but it, it keeps being important for, for Mexico to a position uh, with the United States. So within this economical pragmatism, we see as well a uh, uh, political idealism that shapes another imaginary that uh, um, calls a state agents um, and, 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 um, and the system as well, uh, calls for another system. Felipe, sorry, you got two minutes. Yeah, thank you. So this this um, other political idealism is it's, uh, rooted uh, on the Zapatista movement, this uh, armed uh, movement that was indigenous and that established a world where uh, nobody is left behind, where all worlds um, are within. And so regarding this, uh, respecting the time, we have San Cristóbal de las Casas um, and the Municipio Oventic, uh, which are also cities from Mexico. Uh, it's a city that is built and established uh, from an imaginary that comes from Europe, from the hegemony, um, from the European hegemony, but also um, shows uh, some some imaginaries from Mexico. Um, it, it it shows um, racism as well. Maybe I, I should have said this uh, on the beginning, but this, this all comes from a field uh, field research that, that I did uh, here uh, on these cities. And I, I find it very interesting to do this, this linkage linkage uh, between also the Caracol Oventic, um, which is a Zapatista autonomous uh, rebel territory that uh, 
uh, of course existed uh, well before but after after this this rebel movement um it became linked not only with with a uh, rebellion itself but also with uh, every other imaginary um with this um memories and collective memories that have to do with the uh, mexican revolution in uh, 1910 in 1810 sorry uh, that are separated from the bad government, the bad management of the government, uh, and they call the state and also the, the, the practices, the state practices, um, saying that they, of course, were wrong. This is, uh, this all is very small, considering the huge power of the hegemony logic that is within the country. Um, of course, uh, th this has uh, stayed here in Mexico for 20 years, and this will not become into the uh, hegemony logic because, of course, the state and the imaginary that is behind the state is too strong. And of course, that's why he, it is hegemonic. Sorry, can you close because we're on time? Yes, I just have one slide. So here we have uh, the comparative analysis between um, these two cities. Um, they are one of them is autonomous. The other is uh, linked to the to the state. Uh, in San Cristobal, there's there's a narrative that is related to uh, colonial patterns. And on the other side, in Caracol Oventic, this um, self-managed uh, Zapatista space um, is linked to the own Zapatista movement and with um, autonomous movements to the and linked with the imaginaries of uh, self-government of Cristobal um, replicates um, spaces of the city and also non-hegemonic spaces that try to replicate this other imaginary that, that try to not be subjugated by this um, traditional imaginary. I, I think I'll close here uh, to respect the time. I, I hope I, 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 I was clear on what I was trying to say, and thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. I, I think we can discuss further in the questions. Gracias, Felipe. Eh, sí, como dices, luego seguimos discutiendo todo, sobre todo esto. Thank muy you, Felipe. Yes, as you were saying, we will keep talking later. This is very interesting. Thank you, Felipe. We will go now with the second talk. This is from one of the members of our group of intercultural studies. Diego Benavente is going to present about La Quente Guarriate narratives in the metropolitan extension of Concepción. Hello, everyone. This is my presentation. I'm going to present the work of a project UCO, UCO. There are um, slides in exposition in the hall of this building. And we also have a video that is going to be presented tomorrow. Okay, let's begin with the issue that we identified. Mainly, it was that the collective imaginary in the Concepcion Bay 
y start the Mapuche Laf Kente imaginary is not part of the hegemonic imaginary of the territory. This territory was colonized by the Spanish crown. So they progressed with the colonization of La Araucanía. During this period of colonization of La Araucanía by the Chilean state, the population was under this productive processes. This happened during colonial times and also during the Republic of Chile. So this was in a La Quente territory in the metropolitan area of Concepcion. This is in the north of the Bio Bio region. So we have been taught in schools that uh, the Bio Bio River is the limit of the Mapuche people as if there was not nothing else after that river. Lately, we've had different environmental conflicts in the territory. The people there have their positions in this conflict and they have a, a struggle with the different positions that come from the hegemonic sphere. Considering this background, we, we bring this uh, research question that is how these territorial narratives of the population are articulated in the processes of expansion and consolidation of the metropolitan area in Concepcion. So this is specifically about La Quente Guariache population. In the picture, we can see the expansion of the city and the depredation, destruction of minerals. These activities are carried out in La Quente territory. Something interesting about this work is the methodology that we used. So we combined traditional techniques of social sciences. We had some interviews, speeches. We had some special analysis. We considered specific geographical points. And on the other half, we also used Nutram, which is the Mapuche word for conversation. And that was another type of research method. So this Nutram is a way of observation and it is also a means to pass knowledge and understand different realities. In this, there is a specific called subject and a specific called individual that is putting their words there and another individual is receiving them. During these conversations, many ideas were brought into life that were shaping, that were used to shape the main objectives of the research. So we had the idea to change the orientation of the cartographies that we will be soon seeing. Initially, we thought these cartographies oriented to the north as it is made everywhere. So we gave it a twist and we use the traditional orientation of the Mapuche people trying to decolonize this orientation and trying to think as well the way in we conserve in the territory. So as a result, as I was saying in the beginning, we created two cartographies 
And uh, those are part of the exposition that is currently in the hall. And also a video that we will watch tomorrow in the in the documentary session. Our first cartography is the one that we can see here. It is about intercultural conflicts in the metropolitan area of Concepcion. We identify different conflicts and we divide them in environmental conflicts and social <laughs> social conflicts. Here. And we identify Mapuche Lafkente presence. We identify that conflicts are mainly in the urban area, in La Guardia, which is the city in Mapungu, in the Mapuche language. So mainly these conflicts were related to wetlands. So as we were saying, we have environmental conflicts and social conflicts, and these environmental conflicts were related to different industries that weren't included in the planning. Another of the mappings of the maps, cartographies that we created, we wanted to include all the information we gathered in just one document. As I was showing you, we, we used NUTRAM and all the conversations. So from those conversations, we decided to separate, to do two instruments instead of just one, which was the original idea. So here we can see uh, that Mapungu, the Mapuche language, gives is used to name almost every town, municipality in this area. We counted six trehues. This archaeological site belong to early stages of occupations and archaeologists state that they are not Lafkente. But maybe when these uh, categories were established, there were some different ways of thinking different than the ones we currently have. Many of this um, cartography aspects are also included in the names of the places, the names themselves. Through this work, we also could highlight or we could prove the importance of applying research methods that are decolonial and inter intercultural. These two cartographies that we produced are a contribution to make visible and to collaborate with the claims of the Lafkente Warriache voices. With this, we also want to contribute to new outlooks that allow us to rethink the territorial order. The cartography of these places, of these meaningful places, is also backing the political sense of the Lafkente Wariate organization's claim to the Chilean state. So it is necessary to progress in this aspect. This is just the first step. This is just the first exercise to bring this 
toponymies, the names of the places from the original languages, the indigenous languages. So this is the bibliography, the sources we use, and that will be it for me. Thank you very much. Gracias, Diego. Eh, bien, pues vamos a cerrar esta... Thank you, Diego, very much um, for this. Uh, so we will close this first part of, of the morning presentations with Estefania Álvarez, uh, who's going to present critical mapping of toponymy, gender gaps and local history through street names in the Temuco, Padre Las Casas Conurbation, Chile. Eh, hola, muy buenos días. Eh, Hello, good morning. I'm, I'm going to try if it works. Yes, it works. So, um, thank you very much um, for the invitation. This is the second year I'm here. And the, the first time I was here, I, I presented this the, the, the first part of this investigation and now I'm here to present the results of this process. Just to, to have a, a slight understanding, uh, to have a slight understanding of this uh, presentation, I, I will have these indicators at the end of uh, each slide so, so we can see uh, where we are. Uh, I'll begin with the conceptual framework. Um, the the approach of the problem, the results and the reflection. And I'll, I, I have also some other indicators to see uh, each key element of every section. Um, we will be seeing uh, mapping, uh, topographic language and toponymy, and also gender students. Here my time because I, I don't wanna I don't want to pass from my assigned time. So I'll begin uh, first with the questions that Linda McDowell indicated um, when she said that places indicates um, legal norms. This first idea uh, leads us to uh, questioning of uh, who actually belongs to the places and who's excluded from these places. Parallel to these uh, indications that came at the very end of the 20th century, we we saw this androcentric perspective that was very criticized um, regarding the topic of uh, researches. They also uh, started criticizing criticizing the spatial technology and the hegemony uh, of English as well, because um, the ones that did not speak English were left uh, outside these investigations. So um, I wanted to emphasize uh, in this topic of what is established. Um, and they also um, use language as a spatial space. Diana Land in 2019 uh, said that uh, feminist geography allows the the conquer of uh, spaces and visibilize some social relations that uh, usually discriminates women and dissidences as a uh, political and social control. So with these big ideas, we have that historically, um, this group of people has uh, been excluded, women and dissidences uh, from the power course as just to uh, go to the line of investigation of this research, we have from Carol Paterman, a feminist researcher, that the public was the city and the private was at home. So um, people were using these public spaces while women was uh, relegated to private places. 
Therefore, we see the arising of gender relationships and also discrimination that are multiple and cross-cutting. So it's necessary to make visible the heterosexism that restricts and limits the, the use of women and dissidences to the public space. We, we saw um, this, this heterosexism uh, during the COVID pandemic as we, we had our private space and our public space. Um, this research as well was also framed uh, within the within a European university because we had um, certain codes that were established by this hegemonic knowledge. So the um, terminology is very specific and our trending. So within this context, I speak on orthographic language, as it was mentioned before, metaphor has power and is created by any tool that transmits language. And on this concept, uh, street names uh, are also uh, an aspect that can be explored regarding memory, uh, urban memory, and that can be studied through the practices that um, ambi-civilize peoples and places and also mapping uh, as a tool that allows us to unify uh, knowledge. We use history to understand the, the cross-cutting histories of uh, the people that were present um, for this study uh, through linguistics uh, and from uh, geography as well to understand power. So, um, for example, the localization of a certain street with a toponymy, with a specific uh, toponymy, uh, we were allowed to uh, investigate this through the gender perspective. Uh, too much uh, pandemic uh, took me away from the from the in-person dynamics. So here uh, we go fully into feminism and uh, regarding this per perspective, intersectionality uh, is, is a bridge uh, between uh, colonial perspectives and modern feminism. So uh, colonialism can also be understood uh, as a relation it is also emphasized the ex exclusion of women uh, from the predominant uh, speeches and discourses. So with all this background, it is very important to create uh, B-civilization mechanisms, uh, specifically from, from these uh, groups that are in the periphery and the third world, as we were uh, entitled. So women specifically from the indigenous peoples were invisibilized uh, regarding patriarchal mechanisms and uh, also racial mechanisms. So this area uh, in Southern Chile, in Temuco and Padre Las Casas, which is the capital region of Temuco. Uh, I, I grew there, I did my bachelor's degree there, and here we could see certain concerns uh, that you can also see from field trips um, where you can see better these concerns. So the goal of this uh, research was to uh, compare the public presence of women in the streets of Temuco to understand gender gaps related to the local history of Temuco and Padre Las Casas. I, I think this can look a little bit too complex, but this is the methodology. Uh, we establish three specific goals. With each one uh, of these, we established, of course, um, ways to go forward. So for the urban network classification, we came up with uh, several strat strategies. We tried it with uh, gender mechanisms, but we were not able because the pandemics uh, really 
made it difficult to to get together with people that were uh, very far away. So at the end, we worked individually uh, uh, at the end of 2019 with uh, some papers and publications from the National Library. Then we went to the second specific uh, goal that was the analysis of uh, spatial patterns where we identified two parameters, space and time. Uh, in space, we established mapping and in time a temporal line where we showed uh, the growth of, of, the, of the city in contrast with um, gender events, let's say. So we did a biographical description of um, free use encyclopedias. Um, we also take a look to registers of uh, Chilean memory where we were able to, to contrast the, the growth of the city and the lives of the women that were in there so that we could understand the life uh, of the women uh, regarding the territory. Tenemos de que de esta clasificación de la red vial solamente 864 calles de un total de From this classification only 864 names of the street which is the 27 uh, 8% it belongs to names of persons or surnames. We have here different conceptions and they can change in the future, specifically considering the tech technology process that is being carried out in the contemporary society. From those names, we also made a classification there to see how many names of women or men were there. So from these 864 names of persons, 53 are names of women, which is the 6% of the total of the data analyzed. From these street names, we found that the main part of them were in small street and this is both in Padre Las Casas and Temu. So here we have the growth patterns related to the second research objective. They were counting time since the creation of the city of Temuco as, as the city itself that was in 1960. Here we have the growth of the city and the institutionality of the municipality of Temuco. So we consider the tool that indigenous communities have to understand that there is occupied territory. Here we have some main, some main historical moments, such as the entry of women to the university, the women voting, and also the occupation of this process that has that happened in parallel. We also identified the 
the hydroelectrical plant as a important event because it there weren't any events like this one before still talking about these patterns of growth we find the classic spaniard planning of the city and we also have the extension of the expansion in the present so this is a result of the growth pattern that we saw the green color is associated to the name of persons and specifically about women which is the object of study names of women we have the purple color here you can see in the space which are the streets that are inside the city within the city we also have the intersectionality of women and the name of the women that are the names that are used so from these 51 women because we had uh, some names repeated and we have that all of those women are from the contemporary time and they are part of this contemporary life this is a territory that is mainly indigenous and although it has this characteristic there there are only two names of women from this contemporary era these names are in the periphery of Temuco, in the outskirts of Temuco, in, a, in an area that is marginalized in the city. Finally, we have this absence or this omission of women is part of the time. So, when we talk about modern women or contemporary women, what do we understand? Which are this, uh, this reference regarding sexual identity? We only found Gabriela Mistral that, according to some studies, might have been bisexual, but there are no women from hard science from technology, from invention, and less from domestic work and care. Regarding the intersectionality, we don't have women from with uh, disabilities or Afro-descendant women. Regarding the conclusions, we have the classification of the urban network only Six percent of the total of the names belong to names of the women. They are located. The street names are located in the peripheries. Regarding the second objective, we think that this analysis it doesn't have a gender approach it is an intersectional there is a tendency of use of male names and it is also far from the natural natural barriers regarding the public presence of women of this 53 only two 
where the name of the same person that we had a big presence of women from America, 13 were from Chile, four from La Araucanía. There's also an oral tradition regarding to this. There we have the main Hanikeo, that it was the surname of a warrior, that it was a discovery for us. We didn't know that we had a Mapuche warrior. Yeah. And last but not least, consider that this domestic and care work is considered less valuable. And it is also so in this street name. So that would be it. Thank you very much. Bien, muchas gracias, Stephanie. Eh, a los demás ponentes también. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie, and the rest of presenters, uh, Felipe and Diego. Uh, I think you're still there. So uh, thank you very much, Miguel and Janina. I will invite you all uh, to sit on the table, literally, um, to discuss and talk on these topics. Uh, because I, I feel like we, we need a lot, um, uh, uh, we have a lot to discuss. Um, maybe Diego and Stephanie can see it here and Felipe also virtually. Ahora sí, ya. Yeah. Ahora te veo, Felipe. Hola, que es que no te he visto. Yes, okay, Felipe, I can see you here. So, well, maybe we should open up the debate um, of what we've uh, been speaking about. I'm very interested uh, in discussing, of course, interesting and controversial discussions. Why not? Um, I, I have many uh, things that I that I noted here. Um, I, I, I've got the feeling maybe that Felipe uh, came short with his time. So um, when when I read or or when I see when I see uh, approaches. Um, from, uh, for example, Palestine, that are so dark, let's say. I, I, I'm always uh, suspicious. I don't really like them. I feel they are paralyzing and they're very essentialist. I don't know, Felipe, what do you think uh, about this division uh, of the world? Very complex as well and, and so liquid. Uh, as as the one from the 21st century. I don't know if we can still speak uh, about uh, center periphery um, or peripheries in general. If it, it, it is very complex and it, it moves, it can be replicated at, uh, at any scale. Uh, the system is very dynamic as well. I don't know, Felipe, if you still believe that uh, our system operates um, as a center periphery. This is this is what I wanted to ask you and, and the rest, of course. And as well, I wanted to ask you um, if it is able for you to explain uh, about the resistance spaces, uh, which I'm really interested about. Uh, what are they or when where we can see the spaces of resistance that you showed us? and how they built uh, counter imaginaries, um, counter narratives uh, for what uh, uh, 
uh, what objective? What's the objective? Muy bien. <coughs> Well, uh, thank you very much for the question. Yes, uh, I came up a little bit short with my time, but um, responding, answering in order, I, I, I think I've always debated myself uh, specifically on, on what you mentioned on this idea of uh, Valenstein. Uh, I, I, I think I mentioned it during the presentation, maybe as I, as I did it very fast, not clear enough, but uh, Wallenstein following following uh, the postulates of, of another author uh, speaks about peripheries. However, I think that uh, within uh, uh, this changing world, this very changing world during the 21st century, I think these categories need to be um, um, complexified um, from the 19th century uh, some practices are consolidated by the end of the 20th century and I think these practices should be also more uh, complex by this century regarding the coloniality of power and also what is happening in Europe, for example, with the conflict between Ukraine and Russia, the ascent of uh, China and the United States. I think we, we need to make more complex these, these relations. They're not simple. And for example, if you take the ascendment of China, uh, the, the ascent of China and the relation with Latin America, we can, uh, of course, have uh, relations, uh, asymmetric relations um, between between the, the, the peripheries and the center, of course. Uh, so the center right now is not uh, longer in Europe, but was translated, was uh, moved, sorry, to, to China, to the Pacific. So in this sense, we, we see um, depicted this, this system that uh, uh, Badenstein was speaking about. Uh, but right now we have everything, uh, it, it's not that everything is more liquid, but it's more complex. These categories need, need, needs, uh, need to be more complex. And peripheries is of course uh, plural. As you said, they need to be amplified because the concepts um, in methodological terms, uh, we can actually use them uh, as elastic. So I think it would have sense methodologically um, to contribute to other concepts, I think. Um, this is what I tried uh, to do on my PhD thesis, which is not the topic um, here. But uh, okay, uh, regarding the second question regarding uh, resistance space, I think for it to be very well understood, um, this vision, this pragmatic vision of the Mexican state vis a vis this uh, idealism counter hegemonic is, is very uh, present. The, the 1st of January in 1994, I think this is the year uh, where Mexico uh, signed a, a treaty with the United States with uh, liberal characteristics, of course, uh, regarding free trade. And uh, this is the context, the, the context where uh, these uh, resistant movements uh, arose from uh, Emiliano Zapata uh, that, that comes from the revolution, the Mexican revolution in 1910. I'm not a specialist. Uh, but uh, I had to, to review it uh, for my masters. Uh, the Mexican Revolution had many leaders. One uh, was Pancho Villa, uh, very known uh, for uh, this name, if, if, if it wasn't his name, but also Emiliano Zapata, who um, reivindicated uh, the indigenous sovereignty. And from there, uh, the 20th century, uh, they, they took uh, this imaginary of the armed movement uh, of the Zapatistas. 
um, this art movement uh, arose because, of course, the uh, hegemonic vision um, is very strong, is crushing uh, and is overwhelming for the territories. They are being forgotten. Um, they are not part of the of the political and social process led by the Mexican state. So they, of course, are located within a geographical zone that, that is all along uh, Chiapas, distributed all along Chiapas. But I take uh, El Caracol because it's strategic uh, as an autonomous rebel territory. And uh, there's a narrative, of course. We have uh, the leader, uh, the Marco uh, is, is the name of the leader. Uh, after that is Galeano. And we have a, a building of a narrative that comes uh, fr from the roots. Uh, and this uh, imaginary is, is um, of reivindication, anti-capitalist and anti-hegemonic sometimes uh, anarchic, anarchic, sorry. So here where, where they, they tried to make understand that every world was able to fit within the, the, the global context. So Marco, this leader, um, this, this um, intercultural movement is not able to be exported uh, let, let's say it is not possible to, to sell this, this um, system of, of um, different autonomous territories, etc. So uh, for whom? Uh, it's, of course, uh, for the indigenous peoples, um, the, the women, farmers, uh, not, not only uh, in southern Chiapas, which is one of the, the poorest regions, in Chiapas, but um, also looking uh, to the rest of the world, the, the, the poor peoples uh, in Latin America as a displaced uh, region with um, the, the, the aim of breaking this vision, the bad management um, by, the, by the Mexican state and, and this imaginary uh, uh, that the uh, the 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 whole um, theory from uh, the Zapatista movement is uh, anti-globalization, is anti-capitalist, and of course wants to create a difference uh, between the the forces relations. This is what I I can say by now. Quería darte un poquito más de, de espacio, ¿no? eh, por eso te lancé esta pregunta, porque pensé que antes la presentación como que quedó un poco corto esa, esa parte. ¿no? Eh, no sé si Estefan... Thank you very much. Thank you for explaining this, because uh, we felt that uh, that was missing from the initial presentation. Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation. It caught my attention, the visualization of cartographies of mappings that you were showing, because this explained this difference between center and peripheries and the sea, the Pacific Ocean as a key point of reference, also as a way of unity in America in the Americas as a continent. So it shows this urban planning in different continents. Um, the expectation is mainly made in the Pacific. So it calls my attention because these maps maintain Europe in the center, although Europe is not being mentioned. That was just a comment that I wanted to make. I'm remembering all of you, reminding you that at any time you can, uh, you can raise your hand and ask any question. 
Por ahí tenemos Thank you, una... Felipe. Thank you, Stephen. Adelante. We have a question now here. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment. And it is for the Lafkenche territory. Um, Temuco, the streets. So in the end, we talk about the decolonial methodologies that are needed in your research. So I wanted to know if you could share one of them in research, considering that in my own research, the methodology became content from the beginning. There was a moment in which it became content. This writing and the research became content. So it was very important and it was also part of the progresses of the results of the study on the content itself. So all of this research is on the present. So if you could also mention this interculturality, as you were mentioning, this the colonial and intercultural methodologies. So from the Western traditions, only some of them were valid, or and the others were not considered serious or valid. And regarding the the Muko position, I want to congratulate all of the speakers. And in the Muko, the author, there is an author from a magazine from Colombia. And it mentions a key concept that both Felipe and Stephanie have mentioned that is related to nature. So many times this nature is related to the feminine subject, to the female subject. So these proposals many times are more complex and they turn into something different when we think of race and ethnicity, when we think of sex, when we think of gender and class and economy, species, so human species, uh, mammals, and also regarding disabilities, depending on topic and objectives, we can find different intersections, right? And finally, a comment. When you mentioned this Hanegea that I have read many times, as a person that is not from this country, I have read it in the streets, Hanage, many times. And, and I had no idea it meant what you were saying. It meant warrior. And I'm also a Spanish speaker, right? We speak the same language. So how do we understand this? In a first look. Thank you very much. So there are many questions. Regarding our research, something similar happened. Technology became important in the research processes. 
So this Netram was key. It is like just a simple conversation, a typical conversation with Mapuche people to exchange knowledge, to talk about realities. This conversation was very fruitful and it was key in our research. And it allowed us to correct errors, to fix things. And we also questions ourselves. We ask ourselves, how can we make this map to be representative of the Mapuche worldview? We checked some research and we talked also with different actors from the territory. So we wanted to use the shape of Kultrun, which is a traditional percussion instrument. This is a very practical way of representing this twist in geography. So I was, as I was saying, throughout the whole process, uh, that was the the key part of our work. And later to review, we found these results, and in our research. The process was very fruitful. The research was the first approach to the Mapuche of Kente presence in the territory. And we didn't mean to emphasize the results themselves, but wanted to see all these methods that allow us to enter into this intercultural and colonial world. They have a horizontal approach in these conversations. And this is different from the typical or the mainstream research, because sometimes we have this difference of power and this top-down approach. So in its essence, it allows us to generate knowledge in an intercultural way. And it is not just that the researcher goes and gives knowledge, but they also receive from the community. They receive information. So this is key, this relation is key in our study. Well, I also wanted to mention something regarding this question. What you mentioned is also something that I ask myself constantly during my research. Particularly my master's was in uh, University of Barcelona, so it is European. These questions, these intercultural and colonial questions were not present there. So with that, we think, how do we do this? All of these contents, different contents allowed me to create tools to use mapping and a digital platform to bring this idea strategically to talk about technology, to talk about feminism, although it is a territory that it has, this territory, it has been historically 
the place where indigenous people live, it, it would seem that it is something that is not established. So it is also how do we create different elements to think about different spaces and different places. Although we use very precise terms, not everyone can understand them because they are not very self-explanatory. So I think that's an important discussion to continue the conversation going because this is how we transmit knowledge. Geography has given me tools to make visible this observation. That is not only explained through difficult words, words, but through language in its different ways can be delivered. In higher education, these terms are also explained so people can acquire these terms. So that's from it. I also want to mention something different with some colleagues. We were discussing about geography. Um, yeah, which is part of the Mapuche culture, and it's an, a spiritual being that protects some spaces. And we have this Mian represented in some streets. Can we incorporate it? Do we have to make it gendered? Are we allowed to do this? So it was an interesting conversation because these are things that in the Western culture are not understood. But for Mapuche and indigenous culture, they are perfectly fine and people understand them and they can talk about them, but from their own world view, with their own terms, with their own words, not with the words from academia. So these differences are also interesting. Thank you, Felipe. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Diego. Thank you also to the colleague who made the questions, who brought to the table this very interesting topic. All of this gender considerations that Stephanie also mentioned. We can do some intercultural research. Every day, I think, hey, why do I do this? Where am I going to do this? How is this going to work? And I got the feeling, I'm almost certain that all of these colonial methods and tools and interculturality I, I feel that they have been maybe dominated by the academia. The academia has made an appropriation of these topics. And at the academia, as we know, functions very top down, it is hierarchical, it is not horizontal. So I would like to open up the debate as well to hear some comments from the public regarding this appropriation with this interest and how we are being we how we are witnessing all of this and people sometimes sit on a bar and they talk about this topic so that's an academic format whether we like it or not, whether we want it or not. And we're being part of it, maybe a passive part of it, but we are also there. And I also want to think about this time, this period, 
and this etymonic logic that exists. So I think it's on us to do whatever we can in order to show this resistance spaces to collaborate in different places. So I'm always very cautious when I present things from other people. We have to be careful so we don't fall into this colonial and top-down dynamics. I, I, I was moved by what you were saying, this last uh, comment, this uh, representation a little bit mean uh, of the academia. Uh, I do not feel represented by it uh, because, well, my situation as a postdoctorate is it's not of, uh, I'm not speaking from the privilege, but uh, thank you for, for provoking this, this, this feeling, of course. It is important um, uh, to, to, to question um, this thing as well. Uh, as Felipe was, was saying about these uh, complex systems, this world system that uh, has a weight but but it's very complex as well to to actually show how much it weights um intersectionality is very different uh it, it crosses everyone uh, of us i'm i'm oppressed as well uh i'm oppressing myself um so provoked by by your uh comment uh, I think it was very important what uh, Reed said. Um, I think um, we we should uh, here uh, united. We should of course think about uh, different methodologies. Why um, why methodology is something so important uh, about the content? Um, in my case, I had to do my master's in Europe in Spain. Uh, a part of it, and I, I know, of course, uh, a little bit of process in France, and I think these are institutions that were left, that stayed uh, on the in the 20th century, uh, on the past past century, uh, and here in Avia Yala, I see possibilities that these methodologies can change. Uh, and can move forward. I, I see these efforts, I see endeavors from the people that are here and from the people that uh, I like uh, to establish alliances that we're changing the way of making acad uh, academia. Of course, we're failing. There are things uh, to get better, of course, but um, I think this is part of the learning. Methodology is not only the, the way of how we can extract methodology, is as well uh, something that motivates you to understand the problems. Uh, problems are not uh, all the same. Felipe was saying in his presentation, we have subalternities and to understand every space, every subalternity, we need, we need different approaches. And if this helps um, uh, to share our experience, uh, it helps to be motivated uh, on our own context to understand reality and to understand the, the, the reality next to us and from the people that are actually experiencing phenomena. Um, when when the video documentary were, were showing yesterday um, and the experiences that were being commented, I, I, I felt the same. It's very similar in Mexico as well, but because the, the world system is there um, and this diversity of methodologies, I think, uh, are, are uh, moving us forward to, to 
different ways of doing things, of doing investigations, and they're helping to um, orient, to, to look for solutions, to inspire uh, new ways as well, because times when when uh, we're lonely, um, isolated, and you cannot move forward, this is something I see a lot uh, in my community. Uh, I will speak about it uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, I was very moved, so I could not stay silent. Thank you. Esa era la intención. Gracias. <laughs> no a ti personalmente, sino mover esto, interpelar al a los que estamos aquí reunidos, ¿no? Y reunidas. Eh, bien, no sé si hay alguna opinión más acerca al respecto o acerca de otra cosa. Si no, lo podemos dejar aquí para. Sí, Diego quiere. Sí, adelante. Eh, eh, ahora, está, sí, ahora sí. Yo creo que parte importante de ir a de esta relación que se da de normalmente como extractiva de ir al lugar a, a sacar el, el, el conocimiento y traerlo acá a la academia y procesarlo así como si fuera una fábrica eh, parte importante de quebrar eso es responder a una pregunta muy simple que hace la gente cuando uno va a conversar con ellos y qué es y para qué la gente muchas veces eh, uno le va le, le explica todo lo que va a hacer todo lo, lo que pretende eh, eh, muchas veces maravillas de, de la investigación que es la panacea y al final la persona dice ya y para qué y, y, y eso qué me deja a mí y yo creo que esa es la pregunta a la que tenemos que responder en nuestras metodologías en nuestras investigaciones no olvidar nuestro rol social que al final somos trabajadores de la ciencia y está, deberíamos estar al servicio de las comunidades de las personas a las que muchas veces vamos a interpelar eh, el objetivo principal de nuestras investigaciones debería ser dejarle algo a ellos, eh, quizás no, no vamos a tener una idea preconcebida de lo que necesitan, pero cuando bajemos a conversar con esas personas, nos van a, eh, a, a decir su necesidad o van a ir surgiendo en el camino y de una u otra manera vamos a poder dejarle algún producto, eh, ya sea alguna cartografía que les pueda servir para, para los, los fines eh, de, de activismo político que puedan tener, por ejemplo, en el caso de la cartografía que nosotros generamos, la cartografía de toponimia eh, surgió precisamente por esas conversaciones de que resultaba interesante e importante para las personas a las que fuimos a interpelar que se generara esa cartografía que visualizara eh, explícitamente la presencia eh, mapuche en el área metropolitana de Concepción mediante la, eh, la, la presencia de los topónimos, por ejemplo, que era una cartografía que no existía y que de cierta forma viene a respaldar eh, a todas estas organizaciones políticas que quieren visibilizarse en el territorio. Entonces, yo pienso que esa es la labor que al final tenemos eh, que responder, esa, esa simple pregunta que todo el mundo, los viejitos por lo general hacen, que son muy pragmáticos, que son mucho más simples dentro de toda esta complejidad en la que no, nos acostumbramos a estar, que es el, ¿y, y para qué? Básicamente. Esa es la gran pregunta. ¿Para qué? Sí, estoy de acuerdo. El para qué y para quién y para quiénes, ¿no? Que yo creo que siempre tiene que estar aquí gravitando, ¿no? En nuestra cabeza eh, a la hora de cuando queremos hacer nuestros proyectos e investigaciones, ¿no? Y recogiendo el guante también de la compañera, hablando de las metodologías, creo que más allá de etiquetar qué tipo de metodologías utilizamos, si fueran, sean de coloniales o no, o, o interculturales, eh, creo que es importante también eh, ser creativos e inventar nuevas formas de, ¿no? ya que tenemos, <coughs> supuestamente tenemos la capacidad para ello ¿no? y es nuestro trabajo además. ¿no? Creo que es muy interesante, eh, ya para cerrar, recogiendo la cita con la que empezaba de Harvey, ¿no? hablando de, de la capacidad creativa de pensarnos y de pensar los territorios cuando definía los imaginarios geográficos, creo que es importante ese, ese inventar, ¿no? eh, que, eh, que al fin y al cabo la invención, la creatividad va de la mano de la imaginación y la imaginación, imaginar no es otra cosa que proyectar una imagen sobre el otro, ponernos en la situación del otro. ¿no? Queremos, creo que debemos seguir proyectando imágenes, crear imágenes, eh, crear 
discursos, metodología, cuestionar los discursos dados, los establecidos, incluso aunque sean de postcoloniales, etcétera, etcétera. Con lo cual creo que eh, lo dejo aquí antes de irnos al café. Eh, bueno, eh, vamos a cerrar con la palabra de Felipe ¿no? Eh, y nos vamos al coffee break y después seguimos. Felipe, adelante. No me gustaría ser, de todas maneras, la última palabra. Así que si es que quieren dejarlo ahí, no me gusta ser la última palabra en, de ningún caso. Pero quería hacer un pequeño, un, un pequeño comentario que tú puedes cerrar después, Carlos. Eh, pese a que a, a mí, al contrario de la colega que, mexicana, creo que, que, que interpeló justamente, no sé si me siento inter, interpelado en un 100%, siento que estoy una posición un tanto diferente en términos disciplinares con los que con los mis demás compañeros expositores y compañeras expositoras uh, sobre todo por mi disciplina uh, intento uh, un poco lo que decía Diego creo que dijo recién el tema de estas gran preguntas de y tú también dijiste hace un momento atrás de para quién o para quién es con qué objetivo um, y hay probablemente hay eh, cuando uno eh, estudia fenómenos quizás que tienen más vinculación con la gente, uh, con los sujetos, probablemente tenga que hacerse esas preguntas quizás más éticas. Ya, uh, por ejemplo, a mí me ha tocado eh, en estas últimas investigaciones hacer trabajos más teóricos, eh, analizar, por ejemplo, la, los movimientos de los estados, qué sé yo, y probablemente ahí las decisiones éticas, no sé si, probablemente si es que ustedes pueden complejizar la situación, pero... Mi visión ética probablemente no sé, si, no sé si esté como en jaque. Y por otro lado, creo que eh, estoy de acuerdo con lo que tú mencionas y que interpelaste justamente a la academia. Creo que a pesar de que muchos estén en, en, muchos estén en contraposición a eso o estén en desacuerdo con eso, creo que sucede. Uh, y por ejemplo, pese a lo que decía la colega recién, que las universidades europeas se quedaron en siglos pasados, pero la producción viene del norte, en su mayoría. Uh, entonces, ahí hay una, también una, hay una contradicción también, que uno también tiene que eh, eh, poderla apreciar. Uh, en, entonces, y creo yo que la lógica del capital hace que justamente también la, nuestra producción académica, y lo decía también Bill Shulhan, que también tú lo mencionas, Uh, hace que nosotros también nos presionemos y entremos en esta maquinaria capitalista de hacer investigaciones, hacer libros que nadie los lee, que finalmente no sirven para absolutamente nada. Porque finalmente lo que hace es que a ti te piden, en la universidad te piden tener un mínimo de producción y finalmente estamos reciclando, 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 porque la maquinaria a ti te, te pide que justamente recicles. Un poco lo que decía también, <coughs> que un poco tú citaste, y, y a, abriste con la cita de Harvey también, ¿no es cierto?, de David Harvey, y yo quisiera también poner atención a eso, que me parece interesante, pero por ejemplo, Schumpeter, Joseph Schumpeter, habla justamente de un concepto que se llama la destrucción creadora del capitalismo, y que el capitalismo es tan dinámico que también imagina y también crea, pero a la vez también destruye. Entonces, en base a la, con, a la construcción y a la creación, no solamente de cuestiones concretas, sino que también de imaginario, construye y destruye. Entonces, claro, ahí hay también un vínculo también muy cercano de lo que dice Harvey también, y que es muy interesante, pero para el otro lado. ¿ya? Eh, con eso quería, con ese comentario quería cerrar, y por favor, no quiero hacer la última palabra. Así que muchas gracias por el espacio también a, a todos y por escucharme también. Gracias, Felipe. Pues no vas a ser el último de, de milagro, porque nos ha, vaya para cerrar aquí, porque si no, por honor al tiempo, que tenemos que tomar café y seguir hablando eh, aquí en el patio. Eh, me han pasado una opinión de, de alguien que está viendo la retransmisión. Voy a leer. Solo concordar con la reflexión del moderador. Hace tiempo que la academia neoliberal se ha apropiado del discurso emancipatorio de la interculturalidad y de las metodologías participativas colaborativas, pero es no, pero no por eso, pero es no por eso que hay que botar la guagua con el agua de su baño. Eh, le siento si las presiones a, a, fran, a francesisdo y creo que hay muchos académicos y académicas que están tratando de hacer las cosas de forma distinta y tratan de aportar a las demandas in situ en la resolución de problemas concretos. 
Ahora sí, al ser inmer ahora sí, al estar inmersa en la academia neoliberal, muchas veces tenemos que mediar entre el cumplimiento de los índices que nos piden y el compromiso con la ciencia y con nuestros interlocutores con quienes trabajamos. Yo creo que este seminario da cuenta de esta preocupación de aportar sobre estos aspectos y se felicita y agradece a los organizadores y ponentes. Pues bien, muchas gracias. Todos estamos en ese conflicto día a día. Creo que por lo menos es bueno tener el conflicto, por lo menos ser consciente de ello e intentar gestionarlo. Y cierro diciendo una frase que siempre digo, cada uno hace lo que puede. Es así de sencillo. <risa> gracias, nos vemos después del café, ¿de acuerdo?